This is Summerlin. So this, we're essentially looking north. We're looking towards downtown Santa Barbara. Uh, so this is what we would now call maybe like the, the, the end of the Rincon Coast, that, that area. And um, this is 1905. So the very first offshore, so, if, so everybody likes to be the first, like to be, likes to be the biggest. And if you look at some of the rhetoric, people say the first offshore uh, oil rigs in the US are in the Gulf of Mexico. That's not true. The first, what we would call modern offshore rigs that are totally autonomous from a boat and everything, yes, those were first put out, out there. But the first oil rigs in, in the ocean, in salt water, that was actually here, that was California. The other, and, and so what we're seeing here is um, a legacy of our history. So this is, again, over 100 years ago, right? And this was not sophisticated technology. This was back in the day when to drill, an, now we, we think of an oil rig and we think of all these people, mostly dudes, standing around a pit and have a big spinning bit and then zzz, drink, drilling into the ground. Back in the day here, it was literally pull a big, um, have you ever seen a plumb bob, a big metal sort of spike? when people are trying to figure out if something's level. That's essentially how we would drill back in, in this time. So people would take a big heavy point, a heavy spear basically, and they would put this rig, which is, which is a, a, a structure, so that you could uh, lever up this big giant um, point and then let it go and it would just bang, hit the ground. Then you go in, you dig the dirt out or the sediment or whatever it is, and you pull it up again, bang. So very rudimentary drilling procedures, not what we would now think about it as. Uh, anybody from some of the readings you guys might have done right? Anybody know why um, all of a sudden, so this was like the first big place in California, the first place in California where we started doing drilling? Anybody know why that was the attraction? No. Excellent. It's early in the morning. <laughs> Got these cats on. Great. Um, so has anybody seen the movie There Will Be Blood? Or was it There Might Be Blood? There Will Be Blood. There will be blood. Have you seen that? So that's, a, that's obviously a fictional account, but that's based on the stuff that happened in Ventura and Kern counties. So that so fictionalized, yes, but all the big stories and, and, and arcs, that's all based on what really, really happened in this era. So what was going on here, so if we look at canoes from native peoples around the world, most native peoples had uh, uh, canoes of animal skin. If we talk about the Inupiat or the Eskimo, or whatever, up in Alaska, kill a bunch of walruses, dry the skin, tighten the skin, and make it watertight. If we talk about the folks that lived in um, in Louisiana or or other places with big trees, they typically chopped the trees down and then hollowed out those trees, either with with axes or with fire, and then they had a watertight boat. Almost unique on the history uh, on the face of the earth were the canoes of the Chumash built here, our local native peoples, the so-called Tomos. And so those were plank canoes. So instead of you know, perfectly stretched tight animal skin or, or intact segments of wood, they made a boat like you and I would make a boat today. It's planks. It's, it's a segment of wood, and then another segment of wood, then another segment of wood, etc. Such that if we took those canoes and put them in the, just as they were initially made and threw them in the water, they would sink. Water would leak in and they would go underwater. So they made those plank canoes and then picked up the tar, the asphalt that was naturally oozing out of the hills and onto our beaches and all that kind of stuff, take up that tar and smack it and, and fill in the holes and cracks and seal it. So it, was, it made it waterproof. So, you know, tumbles could be made here, not many other places else in the world. So this was, so the, the natural existing oil seeps that were not caused by oil companies or anything like that, that just existed here because of our underlying geology, that's what attracted these people. So when they were, people start, first started to figure out that oil is a valuable thing, oh, boom, hey, let's go to wherever it's at the surface. We don't need to do much work. And if we have to dig, we don't have to dig very, uh, very deep. So, so they started on land and they started figuring, hey, there's some of these, these veins of, of oil that, that go out in the ocean. So that's what we're seeing here. These are the first offshore platforms, if you will, that are literally just piers built out into the water, and then these guys are going to go jam some pipes into the, into the ground there. Uh, here is um, uh, just a little bit north of downtown Santa Barbara. This is the Santa Barbara Mesa uh, a, few, a few decades later, but again, everywhere, covered 
oil derricks all over the place, in the ocean, uh, here in, in towns, etc. cetera. Um, this is a shot from near UCSB, and what we're looking at is, what year is this, this is 1890. So what we're looking at is um, a wooden thing that looks like a processing mill, because it is a processing mill. And what these guys have done is they've dug up what looks to you guys like rocks. That's actually all asphalt. So um, the first use in, other than just sort of burning it, the first real sort of big commercial use, uh, other than the native peoples using it to seal vessels and stuff, stuff like that, was to pull up all this stuff and use it as road material, road matrix. So asphalt, like you and I use asphalt today. And they just dug this, scraped the stuff out of the ground, took it, maybe ground it up a little bit so they could be more, more mushed together more easily, and ready, set, go. So we've been using oil and oil products in this part of the world for at least 13,000 years, but intensively for over a hundred, well over a hundred years. And more of the, I mean, the, the, again, these are major industrial scale operations to mine um, things like asphalt. So again, this is just the, the more sticky, uh, rocky, stuck together uh, cookie dough type of oil. This isn't, this isn't necessarily oozing oil. We have that, the, the more liquid side of stuff too. But this is, before we even get there, just scraping off rocks and using those guys. And you can see how, how, uh, how hot this stuff is. Okay, so let's talk about some context. Um, this is what we look like right now. So before we get back to talking about what happened in 1969. So these are, this is our offshore. Now this is a dynamic thing. Again, sometimes we look at the past and we say, ah, that's, that's a done deal, that was very interesting, but that doesn't apply to me. Um, our current federal administration is attempt, so, so um, we have a mix here of state waters that you and I, we control, that goes out to three nautical miles from the shoreline, and then the rest, uh, which goes out to more than 200 nauti nautical miles, is, um, uh, federal waters. So we have here, because we, we have this funky situation, we have islands here off the Santa Barbara Channel. Uh, the island is land, that's state, that's state um, uh, territory. The mainland, obviously, is state of California territory. And what we have here, so you see the, this green line, you see these different lines. Uh, so this is, um, sorry, actually it's this, this darker color here, but this is the state boundary. So we control the land, the water here. Past this, it's federal. Uh, it's federal property, federal uh, jurisdiction. So we have this funky situation where we go from state to federal back to state. Now, we tend to break things up into political boundaries because that's how, what we like to do, but natural resources and, and, and gr growing challenges that we have to deal with uh, across the planet, they don't behave, they don't know what the political boundaries are. So for example, the underlying strata, the geology here, that, said that is where the oil is, which is gonna dictate what people might wanna drill for it, et cetera. They don't necessarily follow those, those particular boundaries. Um, but uh, what we're looking at here, we see a bunch of these squares. These are leases. This is, you own this. All of us own this. This is a, this is a public uh, resource, a public, um, public good. And what we've decided, so the number one way the US makes money, do, do, you know, do you know how we get money for the government to operate? How do you guys think? Taxes, right. So the number one revenue generator for the US is the IRS, right? So income tax, business tax, all that kind of stuff, we pay that stuff. The number two largest source of income is oil, our oil and gas leases. So we have all of this, this stuff under the ground, under the water, whatever, that's a public good, whether it's controlled by the state or the feds, you and I own that. And so, acting in our best interest, supposedly, your government representatives have sat, you know, sit down, they go, hey, how can we maximize the benefit to people? Um, and so in some cases, we wanna leave something in the ground and preserve it. In other cases, we say, hey, maybe it's really valuable, maybe we can sell it. And so that's what you're looking at. These are squares, these are so-called lease holdings. And, um, and, and they're called blocks because people like to draw squares on maps, so it's you know, like a block. So we have these blocks, and so what happens is the government says, okay, we're gonna, we think there's oil underneath here. And so they say, uh, yeah, we're gonna have an auction. And so this happens on land, this happens on, at sea, there's different agencies that manage it if it's on the land or underwater, but still. And they go, hey, here's this chunk of area where you have the right, uh, we'll, we'll give you the option to drill. 
And so everybody does sealed bids, and so they go to a room, and nowadays it's all electronic. And they say, okay, here's Chevron's bid, here's Exxon's bid, and we bid whatever it is, how many gazillion million dollars for this lease. Whoever offers the most money, and, and is actually a real company, you can't just fake it, but, but they check you out, make sure you're a real company and you have real resources, and then they say who's the mo paying the most, and whoever pays most gets that, it's a lease. So you have acts, you have the, you don't get oil, but you bid on the right to try to drill oil. And so then if you control this, then you would have to pay to bring in your ship or your structure or whatever, poke a straw down into the ground, and whatever you get, you, you know, so, so this is the gamble these companies are making. They're saying, I think there's gonna be oil underneath here, and I think there's X amount of oil, and if oil is selling for Y dollars a barrel, we think we could make money if we spent X number of dollars or Z number of dollars to pay for this. Does that make sense? So that's what we're looking at. So what we're looking at is the legacy that started before the 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill and has continued since. But again, getting back to that point I started with of, of saying that um, the past is not the past, um, is, uh, so, the, so the, the, this leasing of, of your resources began before, and the same thing I should say, just for clarity, happens with gold and other minerals, it's, it's the same idea, right? So you can bid on a public land to do some mining or extraction. Um, anyway, so, so this was starting beforehand, part primarily because of the Santa Barbara oil spill and, and knock-on effects, we, um, it, was, it got harder and harder to drill, and then we eventually got a moratorium on drilling. Again, the Santa Barbara oil spill chief in people's minds saying, so it didn't, it didn't stop people from drilling, it stopped new leases from going in. So folks that still have an oil rig, folks that still have a straw on the ground, they can still, they can still you know, suck that oil out, but additional new, new uh, blocks can't go on the, can't be sold. And that's been the way, that's been that way for decades. Our current administration doesn't like that. So our current federal administration is trying very, very hard to start re-drilling in this area. So, um, so again, this notion, whether, whatever you think, if that's a good thing or a bad thing, this notion of the Santa Barbara oil spill has become, has come into um, focus again because of things like the 2015 Refugio oil spill and this current effort to, to do expanded drilling in, in the so-called Santa Barbara Channel. Cool? What is um, uh, offshore, uh, uh, <laughs> Sorry. it stands for OCS, I should probably know that, I don't know, I can't remember, it's, it's, um, it's outer continental shelf, outer oh. continental shelf operations, sorry, Thank you. okay, so this is an example of some of the things that we have, uh, another bit of history, so when I was an undergrad, I, uh, did a lot of marine biology. So my PhD is in marine population biology. So I'm a marine biologist. So I started that by getting research scuba certified. One of the top commercial diving schools in the country was at Santa Barbara City College. That existed because of all the stuff you see here. So in the 60s is we we're putting in all these incredible oil rigs because of this interest in drilling, 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 drilling. There needed to be folks, at the time all dudes, um, uh, to, to go in and do the me mechanics of putting the pipe in the ground and connecting the you know, welding and all this and that. And so, so we had one of the premier schools in the world for doing this. These things that you'll see, so one of my big frustrations is I, I would love to take my students, love to take you guys out here. As an undergrad, I went out to these platforms. After 9-11, things have gotten much more difficult and it's hard to get you guys out there for security reasons. But it would be great if I could take you guys out to these things, because these are a legacy. You will never, ever in the history of the world see another one of these things. So we have much bigger oil rigs all around the world, the North Sea, uh, uh, all around these days. So we have bigger rigs, but nothing is like this. This technology is too expensive today and will never be built again. What we're actually seeing, what you're seeing here, and what, ha what was the victim of the, Santa, the, the, the primary actor in the Santa Bar 69 Santa Barbara oil spill, are these oil rigs. These, it's hard to explain, this is an Empire State Building, literally, in the ocean. So just like we see the iceberg and you know, the, ver the proverbial tip of the iceberg is what you see and there's a lot more underneath, the same for these oil rigs. So these things are in hundreds of feet of water 
And what you see here, this metal superstructure, it goes down and it gets bigger. So it's like a pyramid. It, it expands out as we go down, right? And it's very, very strong. Can survive hurricane, you know, big giant tidal waves, all that kind of great stuff. Very, very strong. Nowadays, people have realized that's way too expensive. So now our modern oil rigs are basically a big boat that's anchored to the bottom of the ocean. So we have these big, really strong steel cables and we anchor it, it's very stable, it's not moving around at all. They also can take hurricanes and stuff, but they're steel cables attaching us to the bottom. When we're done with, so these days when, when an oil field is played out, meaning there's no more oil in it, well, what we essentially do is cut the cables and float the thing away and put it, move it to the next place. This is an entire skyscraper built into the ground. Um, and, and removing them is a non-trivial thing. We can talk about that if you want. But basically, uh, right now we have 20, and just here off of Southern California, we have 23 such rigs in federal waters. Again, that's more than three miles off the, off the coast. Three nautical miles, a little teeny bit different than the miles you and I, statutory miles, but basically three miles. Uh, so, so farther offshore than that. And then we have four in state waters. Okay. Um, again, uh, by way of context, this is uh, our, our state database of where we, it's the, the agency is the Division of Oil and Gas and it has a big long name. People just call it Dogger. And so these are all uh, wellheads that are either in active production or, or have recently been in production uh, right here in Ventura County, right? So we have wellheads right here by campus. We have wellheads uh, uh, in the, uh, Oxnard Plain, we have well heads up towards Santa Paula, uh, all around. And what you're seeing where there's a larger concentration of dots, that is on essentially a tent, a, a geological tent, because of the way the rocks are, are, uh, have, have um, evolved. And so they make it uh, essentially a pockets of oil and gas. And so where we have these pockets, you have tons of, so obviously you can see a line here, you can see a line here. But check it out, right? Oil and gas are, is, is a key, is a massive part of our part of the world. Um, and yeah, I don't know what I was gonna say with this, something super important and very insightful. This is from 1928. Um, and so there's, a, there's some insight for you, you're welcome. Okay, um, so let's talk about a little more history. Is, does that make sense so far? A little bit of everything, sort of, we got a lot of oil around, oil in the water, oil in the air naturally occurring oil seeps where oil just oozes out is a natural thing here. Um, now, the amount of oil leaking out has changed based on how we've sucked oil out and gas, but the fact that you go to the beach and you have tar on your feet, that's not caused by, necessarily caused by the oil companies, right? That's just, it's a part of, of the natural ecology of this area. Okay, so let's talk about um, uh, oil spills. Um, lots of numbers here. I would suggest you jot some of these down just to get a context. It's really, really, uh, it's really easy to get confused. So the first number I'd have you guys look at is look at the very bottom of this slide. Anytime we talk about something controversial, and so oil spills are obviously controversial. Nobody likes oil spills, despite what people say, that oil companies don't like them, environmentalists don't like them, nobody likes them. But nevertheless, they're very contentious uh, things. Uh, and so what you find, whenever we have a contentious thing, you need to pay very, you guys need to be very close readers of facts. It's hard to overemphasize how many people these days are counting on you being stupid. They really, really are. They're counting on you being dumb, you not being critical, you not being an active reasoner. So what they'll do is they'll switch to using percents as opposed to numbers. They'll switch the units from gallons to barrels to tons to whatever to either overemphasize, in the case of an oil spill, how much oil is released, or to minimize the number of, of how much oil was released. So what I have here on the bottom is a, is a translation for you, right? A Rosetta Stone for understanding stuff. So if people use the word ton, if we talk about a ton of oil spilled or something of that nature, that equals uh, the kind of gallons that you and I put in our cars, that equals 308 gallons, US gallons, statutory gallons, or 7.33 barrels. So again, depending on what, what source you're looking at, people will use barrels or gallons or maybe liters or these different things. One barrel of oil, it's a whole weird, bizarre, historic reason why we have a barrel, but we're screwed, we're stuck with it. One barrel equals 42 US gallons or 35, 
what some of the rest of the world uses for gallons. So you can see, when you're reading something, you want to pay close attention, because somebody could, could make reference to imperial gallons instead of gallons, the, the you know, US gallons. So, so the point is, know your units, right? And the, the, the most important one here, uh, in terms of the stuff you would probably read, is this notion of barrel to gallons. So one barrel equals 42 of uh, the gallons that you put in your car. Cool? What is the barrel like when you see it? It's, 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 so if you guys have seen like, um, uh, if you guys have seen something that maybe like oil comes to a restaurant in, or, or, or maybe if somebody's uh, putting tar on a roof, so the you know, barrel's about the size of, about up to my hip, about yay diameter. I mean, the original barrels were wooden casks that had, that had a bulge to them, but nowadays we use metal barrels that are, that are uh, metal cylinders, I should say, that are about that big, yeah. Actually, we have, I have some. We, we bought some for our, our drone data race two years ago, so we have a couple uh, prop barrels, but they're buried in our storage, but I guess I should have rolled one over here to show <laughs> you this. But, um, okay, uh, so. Uh, these are all key things you guys should know about. There's, of course, I'm a professor, I'm gonna tell you there's 17,000 other things you should know, but this, you should know this crap right here. This is really important. It's important for you to understand, and so my son is in AP history right now, and he's like, do I need to learn dates? And of course I said, yes! But I don't want him to learn dates just to memorize dates. I want him to learn dates so he can, in his head, have better reasoning. So when he reads an article about something, he knows, oh yeah, that happened during the Revolution war, or that happened during the Crusades, or that happened during the Neolithic era, right? That kind of thing. So you should have, you should know these numbers, not because you're going to get tested on them, but so you can put all the stuff you're reading and will read and will look at over this semester into proper context. Yeah? Okay. And so, um, and I'll send these slides to Stacy. Um, so, so if you, you don't have to worry about writing every single thing down here, but let, let's focus on the names and the magnitudes. So um, the first one, let's talk about the deep water horizon, because that's, that's been the biggest thing in recent years in terms of oil spills, right? So if you've Googled oil spill, uh, one of the first things you're probably going to get, if it's anything related to news or whatever, is going to be the deep water horizon. And there, there's lots of reasons for that. And I, did I send you the lectures on deep water horizon? Mm -hmm. So you guys can watch those if you want some background. Well, that's part of, part of it. OK. So, so OK, so here we go. So, um, just for clarity, uh, this is fl the reference for this first line is the flow rate technical group. These are a bunch of uh, my colleagues, different scientists. Let's see, um, how much time? When do I have to get out of here? Half an hour? It's 9.32. You guys only have 15. Okay, okay. All right, so, uh, so I'll just say that um, numbers are non trivial things, right? And so in the case of the Deepwater Horizon, the folks that drilled the Deepwater Horizon, the wellhead, the folks that drilled the rescue wells, that's probably, uh, uh, arguably more crazy than going to Mars. Insane amounts of technology. It's hard to explain how sophisticated, how, how massively awesome the technology is that these the modern uh, oil uh, drillers utilize. Incredible technology. For all that, when the Deepwater Horizon pipe broke and oil was flooding out, nobody could tell us how much oil was coming out on a daily basis. The numbers were, uh, I wouldn't say lying, because that wouldn't be fair. I would say there was some incredibly massively misleading statements that were made at the beginning of the oil spill. Not necessarily because people were trying to screw people over or, 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 or hoodwink people, although in some cases maybe some people were doing some of that, but um, it was because it was you know, a kilometer and a half down in the ocean, and we didn't have eyes down there. We didn't have instruments down there. So as a consequence, we created this thing, this FRTG flow rate technical group that was born literally because a reporter took a video of the oil flowing out of the pipe and showed it to a fluid dynamics professor at a university and said, they said this much oil is coming out. Is that right? And they, he literally looked at the videotape and said, uh, uh, no, that doesn't look right. So this group was a bunch of folks that just sat there and, and looked at, at high definition flow rates and used visual particle models and all these kinds of things to actually measure how much oil was coming out. This is our best estimate. 
So this is the estimate I use. Later on, a court, a judge, because the oil companies were fighting with the US government and they were fighting over facts, which is kind of strange. You would think that we can all agree on facts. The judge decided that the actual amount of oil that was released was a little bit less than this. I believe the science, not political fighting. And so this is the number that I use. So 208.5 uh, million gallons or 4.9 million barrels, however you wanna, right? Everybody thinks that this top number is the, is, this, is it. Everybody thinks that that is the highest um, release of oil uh, in the US, no. That's the largest marine oil spill. So that's the largest oil spill that was released into salt water in US history. Um, other, other, uh, so the largest oil spill in the history of the planet is another thing that you guys probably don't have any firsthand knowledge of, and that is what Saddam Hussein did in the wake of the first Gulf War. So they invaded this, so this was Iraq. They invaded the neighboring, small neighboring country of Kuwait. Again, all Middle Eastern countries, lots of oil. And the reason why so much oil comes out of the Middle East is it's very easy to drill, and it's what's known as very sweet, very light and sweet crude. Sweet has to do with how much sulfur is in the oil. You and I like sweet oil because it doesn't stink, it doesn't cause air pollution, all that. Well, relatively speaking, it's cleaner. It can burn more, more, more better in our engines and things. If we have so-called sour oil, we have to do more processing to it. So sweet is cheaper, easy to use. And then light versus heavy has to do with, is it more like natural gas or is it more like asphalt? The stuff we have here in Ventura County tends to be very heavy. A lot of things called asphaltines and thick, old like tar. We have a lot of tar. In the Middle East, they have stuff that basically comes out mostly as gas or jet fuel. Very little processing needs to go on. So because of that, uh, we have all this, these incredible oil reserves and that's why the, the, there's so much oil in the Middle East. It's easy, it's cheap, it's the kind people want. So Saddam Hussein decides, hey, I like that, I want that, and so he invades um, the Kuwait with the third largest tank army in the world behind only the US and Russia, and he invades the country and then uh, the first President Bush makes his coalition, then we go and we have war and we drive these guys out. To cover their tracks, the Iraqi army, as they're leaving, they one, they know that the value for the country of Kuwait is all their oil. So they blow up just about every oil well they can find. Other ones, they, they turn on the tap, so they have the oil start flowing out into the, just into the sand and wherever, and then they ignite that on fire so that it made this massive, because we had you know, satellites and all this and that, and so this, these massive plumes of blackness cover the, cover the air and you, we couldn't see the tanks and the folks retreating, right? A very effective strategy from a military standpoint. Massive, 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 unprecedented environmental destruction and, and pollution and stuff. Um, because that was a war zone, we didn't have a lot of people there um, monitoring and checking out what was going on. So we, the numbers here are they're estimates that came from a UN meeting a couple years later. But it's something like on the order of six to eight million barrels of oil was released. Um, and then these percentages I have here on the right, this is relative to the Deepwater Horizon. So we released somewhere around 125, 150% the amount of oil that released in the Deepwater Horizon, which ran for 83 days. Um, and yeah, this sounds okay. Another major one is the Exxon Valdez. So this is also probably before you guys were born. This is 1989. This is a tanker. This is a tanker. So um, uh, this was a drunk dude, a drunk captain up in Alaska, We're drilling in the North Slope of Alaska, piping the oil down through the through mainland Alaska, goes to the ports of South and Southern Alaska and the part of Valdez and uh, load up and those tankers would go down and bring him here down to California or wherever they were going. Basically the captain got drunk, he was totally losing it so he went down, he left uh, another gentleman in charge of the ship that didn't, wasn't very experienced and he ran aground, tore a hole open in the tanker and released the majority of the contents of the, ta of the tanker out onto the shores of uh, this bay, of Prudhoe Bay, or no, not Prudhoe Bay, of, of uh, Valdez. 
Um, other key spills are things like the 1979 Ixtop 1. Anytime you hear somebody say, this has never happened before, they're mostly not right, usually. So before the, the Deepwater Horizon, a similar spill, not quite as big, but a similar spill happened in Mexican waters. This was a, a platform. So these are named after typically, except for the Kuwait thing, these are typically named, most oil spills are named after the vessel that tears open or the, the, the refinery or something like that. So, so this was uh, the Ixtoc platform. There was a series of Ixtoc platforms and this was Ixtoc platform one that, uh, that ripped open. Um, uh, then we have our 69 Santa Barbara oil spill, which we'll talk about in a second. The Torrey Canyon was another really, really important one. This was the first, this was this, this first giant super tanker. People are like, this is so great. We're gonna revolutionize how we move oil around and it tears open almost immediately, and people are like, oh, uh, maybe that's not a good idea. Um, this this uh, breaks ashore and washes up into the, on the southern shores of uh, Great Britain. Uh, and then the other key one I want to mention before we get into talking about uh, Santa Barbara is the Lakeview Gusher. This is the largest oil spill in U.S. history. You can go see this. It's, a, it's about an hour drive from us right now. So if you drive up either straight to Santa Clarita and then go over the grapevine, or if you go up to 33, a little bit longer, um, this is in Kern County. And this was almost twice the amount of oil released as was released from the Deepwater Horizon. This happened almost exactly 100 years to the day, it was 100 years before the Deepwater Horizon. And, and, and again, just for context, the Santa Barbara uh, spill, the 69 Santa Barbara oil spill, was only as a few percentages of what the Deepwater Horizon uh, release was. Cool? And, uh, and, and it was also in water, but where, whereas the Deepwater Horizon was a kilometer and a half down, this was only um, you know, 57, a few hundred feet uh, into the, wall, into the uh, ocean. This is the Lake Ugusher. So don't forget, Deepwater Horizon, not biggest oil spill in US history, largest marine oil spill in US history. So, like I said before, these guys, back in the day, they drill, pull up these spikes, let it go, bang, crashes into the ground, pull it up, bang. So, uh, and, and, and so if you guys are interested, you can go to the Kern County Oil Museum. That's where I got most of these, all my photos related to the um, Lake Gusher. So these are these guys like, hey, let's dig an oil well. They start digging an oil well, and they basically got this th thing. And again, this is, this is before our modern technology. So they're knocking a hole in the ground. So they knocked a hole in the ground and they hit a, a really productive vein, a really near to the surface um, uh, a formation of oil. And it started blub, 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 leaking, right? So typically what you do, and you see all those pictures in the movies like, it's a gusher, right? It's like, you know, it shoots right up. You're like, woo, we're rich, you know, and dancing in oil. Um, so that would typically happen, but that would typically kind of and then over the course of a few minutes or hours or a day or two, it would, it would kind of, you know, the pressure would be released and it would, it would go to more of a burble and people would put an actual straw pipe in the, in the oil and start getting oil. That didn't happen here. It kept, it gushed and it kept gushing and it kept gushing and it kept gushing and people are, are saying, uh, wait, what's happening? And so what we're looking at here, it's hard to maybe see in this black and white photo. This is an oil field. This is a, a, a river of oil flowing out. Um, we eventually uh, create uh, a series of lakes, one that's 30 meters deep, so 100 foot deep of a lake that just burbles up. And, it goes, and so if you look on the left, you see that thing, it's, it's, it's blasting out. Um, these guys are paddling on a lake of oil, and it just kept coming, and, and they're throwing trail, railroad cars, railroad cars into it, jamming it, they kept throwing stuff, nothing would stop it. It was going on, it went on for a year. It went on for so long, they laid an additional line of railroad tracks. People, tourists would get on in Los Angeles, take the train up for the day. Depending on which way the wind was blowing, they would open the windows or not open the windows. If it was blowing to them, they had to have the windows open because they would be covered with oil. But if it was blowing the other way, they'd lower it down and people would, it was literally like going to see a, a freak show. They're like, this is insane. And people, and so this, and this is what you see here in this lower right picture, They've actually sandbag off the main crater. And check it out, this is months later. It's just like, boom, it's like a big tidal wave or if you're in Hawaii in a big, you know, where the tides come in, you see those pictures, a big boom. That's going on day in, day out. 
So crazy. So the only reason it stopped was because essentially all the pressure was totally released. So people didn't know at the time, is this going to go on forever? Is this going to go on for weeks, months, days? It was crazy. So that's the so-called Lakeview Gusher. Let's talk about the Santa Barbara spill. Does, does that make sense? Is that cool? Is that context? All right, cool. Um, now, let me also say, the Lake Dew Gusher, before we start on this Deepwater Horizon, this is the story I get all the time from reporters and, and the public whenever I give these lectures. They say, so what did, the, what did this do? What did the Lake Dew Gusher do to the environment? And my answer is, I don't know. So I have a bunch of guesses that I then can can give you guys, but nobody was out there measuring stuff. You can actually, there's a, a, na, a National Historic Landmark plaque out where this actually was. You can go see it right now. I, I've been out there and it's a bunch of broken bottles and people are drinking and like whatever, you know, doing dirt biking and things you kids do, vaping and things, you know, you ruffians. <laughs> you ruffians. Um, and so, but it's, it's just, it's like a big hole in the ground now. Weeds around this and that. It's hard to know what this did because that whole area is still massive oil production. California, if well, I didn't say this before, California is the fourth largest oil producing state in the US. So we're, we're, we pale in comparison to Louisiana or, or Alaska. But even so, even after a century of sucking oil out of, out of the ground, we're still number four in terms of oil production. So, um, so the Ker Kern County in particular, this area from Ventura into Kern County, very, very productive in terms of oil uh, produced. And so this whole area has been impacted by oil drilling, accidental spills, this and that. So as to what this did, there were not professors like me that went out and started making measurements. Hey, how many coyotes have oil on them or whatever. So we didn't have good measurements. And that's a key story. That's a key part of the story when we get to 1969. We didn't have good baseline data. Uh, so a, a, an example of this, I'll say before we start talking about this is, so what did, what did it, I um, help create a working group that uh, tr has been trying to help people understand what happened with the Deepwater Horizon and, 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 uh, and things related to that. So Deepwater Horizon did a bunch of stuff. The main impact of the Deepwater Horizon was in the midwater was not at the surface or the wetlands like we had originally feared, but it was down deep and in the midwater. And so, for example, my argument is that we killed a gazillion million jellyfish, amongst other things. So one time when I was talking to one of the lawyers from BP, I was like, yeah, so you killed a bunch of jelly, uh, you know, gazillion million jellyfish. He said, oh, really? I said, yeah. He goes, okay. So, um, so how many jellyfish exactly did we kill? And my answer is, well, you know, we don't know exactly. So we didn't have, oh, you don't know exactly. I see, okay, cool. So how many jellyfish were there in the water before? Uh, well, we didn't, weren't taking measurements, I don't know. Oh, so would say the Lord. You don't know? Huh, so you would think that we killed a bunch of jellyfish, but you can't prove in a court of law that we killed a bunch of jellyfish. And I go, well, yeah, but, goes, okay, thanks, Dr. Anderson, you know, boom. So if we don't measure stuff, whatever it is, your bank account right now, Right? If you don't know how much is in your bank account, somebody goes in, hacks your account, takes all your money, and you go to the bank, hey, dude, I had a, another $1,000 in there. The bank's like, really? Can you prove that to me? Like, well, I don't have the statement. Oh, you don't have the statement. Oh, I'm sorry. Right? Mm -hmm. So knowing what the conditions are before the, the bad thing happens. So we have this hurricane about to hit you know, the, the, the Carolinas in a couple days. If you don't know that you have a stove and you have a fridge and you have all this kind of stuff. Hurricane comes, boom, nukes your house and you go to the insurance guys and go, hey, yeah, you need to pay for my stove and the insurance comes and you go, whoa, 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 whoa. Can you show me a picture of that stove? Can you show me the sales receipt? And a lot of times people say, oh, my house is destroyed. All my receipts are, oh, really? Mm, sorry, I'm not gonna pay for your stove, right? Same thing with these. Okay, so let's, let, let's jump forward. Let's uh, talk about what happened. So, six, uh, uh, January. Um, uh, nighttime, 1969, Santa Barbara News Press, local newspaper, phone rings. Reporter guy picks up the phone. Yeah, hello. It's a male, man's voice, and he says, um, you need to know what's going on happening offshore off of Summerlin, which is you know, a few miles south of downtown Santa Barbara. And he said, what? You need to know what's going on offshore. 
uh, there's, there's some bad stuff. And you guys, who's this? And you guys, I can't tell you my name. He goes, what, what, what are you talking about? I'm talking about platform, which at the time it was called platform A, a Unical, seven, what we eventually would call Unical 76 platform. Uh, you, you know, you gotta go check it out, click. And the supporter's like, well, what's that? Is that some, you know, what? That was the first indication anybody outside of the oil company, outside of the platform, knew something was going on. <clears throat> um, a couple themes that I would suggest you guys might want to explore further. The fourth is that, the first, excuse me, is known as this uh, notion of uncontrolled. And also, let me just say, these patterns that em my argument is that these patterns that emerged with the Santa 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill have been locked into our collective consciousness ever since. And it's how you, even though if you don't think about it, this is how you view oil spills. This is how reporters view oil spills. This is how the public views oil spills. This is how environmentalists view oil spills. This is how, I mean, everybody views oil spills through this lens of um, the 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill. The f and then the first aspect of that lens is this notion of immense out of control. Um, now, I should say, another bit of nomenclature, I use the term Santa Barbara oil spill. I use the term Deepwater Horizon oil spill when I'm talking to you guys, to the public, because that's, that's the name and we're stuck with it. Technically, this was not a spill. This was what's known as a blowout. A spill is the Exxon Valdez. So, Valdez, I should say. So um, when we have a contained amount of oil, that, that barrel that Dr. Dr. Anderson was asking about, how big is a barrel? If we had that barrel and I put it on the ground, and I took an ax, I cut into it, and that oil released, that would be a spill. So it's, a, it's a, a contained volume that then is cut open and dribbles out. A blowout is what happened in 69. A blowout is what happened in Deepwater Horizon. It's when we actually have a straw into a reserve, a reservoir, a massive amount of oil, and it's leaking. So, if you, so blowouts are much, much worse than a spill, right? So even if we have a huge tanker that crashes, and we're like, there's you know, a million gallons, or 700,000, or whatever it is, right? As bad as that would be, it's only gonna be a million gallons, or 700,000 gallons, or whatever it is, right? A blowout, as we've seen from the X talk, as we've seen from Deepwater Horizon, as we've seen from, from what Saddam Hussein didn't quit, a blowout is gonna go until we can stop it, right? Or, or the pressure reduces. So it's unclear. Are we gonna need to pay first responders for two days to clean this up? For two months? For two years, right? Is it gonna be a pool of oil the, side, the depth of my ankles? Or is it gonna be a 30 meter deep pool, right? So that there's very different approaches you would take if you had an uncontrolled so-called blowout versus a spill. But because of the nomenclature and the media and everything, people, we call, the popular press, everybody calls these spills, and so I default to calling these spills. So we're gonna all call it the 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill. Oil leaking out, oil leaking out, oil leaking out. All of a sudden, people, the public first notices it as it starts coming onto shore. Send people down with straw bales, literally to absorb the oil, get, you know, clean it up, dig up the oil sand, okay, cool, get it gone, boom, great. Next day, more oil. Jeez, okay, let's go clean it up, clean it up, clean it up, clean it up, clean it up. Okay, good, it's great. Next day, more oil. So this notion of this force that we're being subjected to that is uncontrollable is a key part of this. And it just, it keeps coming and coming and coming and coming. And it feels as if you and I are powerless to do anything. So that's a key thing. Uh, here, here's, here's a map from this, uh, this first study um, in the 70s about the oil spill. And so here's the rig, and you see while the oil did go to Goleta and Santa Barbara, this whole region. A lot of it went down, uh, down to us, down to here in Ventura. So we were, it, this whole region was impacted by this, by this release. Um, and you see this oil on the surface. This is actually a top-down view. This is actually a U-2 spy plane picture. We didn't have any technology to monitor oil spills. So President Nixon at the time tasks a U-2 spy plane, which we don't even acknowledge at the time exists. Um, so my dad was in the Navy, my dad actually fueled the U-2 spy plane one time, and 
he, they, they woke him up in the middle of the night. He's like, whoa. He normally fueled submarines. And they're like, whoa. They're like, come here. And he drove into a, drove into a um, uh, airfield in the middle of the night, no clouds, completely dark. And he drove, like, what the hell is that? There's something around the, the, um, the hangar. It was a couple hundred uh, soldiers with sh standing literally shoulder to shoulder, making a giant ring around the whole aircraft hangar with guns. And they had to separate from the driving a fueled plane. So, so that was a huge secret, a massive secret. The government was not going to say that we had this technology. And in 69, we used that secret spy technology, great visualization tools that we normally were using to spy on our enemies during the Cold War. And that's how we got this picture. What you're doing is you're look, we're looking straight down. Uh, I, don't, I can't remember what day this is. This is a couple days after it started. But we see the, the oil rig straight down the middle, and we see what looks like a bunch of wash. That's oil, in, like, well, most gas, bubbling up. And so it's making this big ring of oil, and it's looking uncontrolled. So when we looked at it close, it seemed uncontrolled. To Joe Blow on the shore, it seemed uncontrolled. When you took pictures from U-2 spy planes, it seemed uncontrolled. It leads to a sense of powerlessness. And here's another one of those uh, U-2 spy plane photos right there. Um, uh, all this oil is coming up. What are we going to do? I'm going to take some straw. I'm going to throw some straw on the beach, and it's going to suck it up, and then I'm going to scoop up the straw. Right? That's essentially what we do today. Some folks will tell you that we're, we're, we're more sophisticated, and we are a bit. But essentially, that's what's going on. So you would think, don't we have some modern tools? Some microbes will go up and instantly eat that bacteria. You know, how can we do it? This is the sense of our technology, our, our spill response technology, our cleanup technology is nowhere near as sophisticated as these truly amazing tools that we have to drill for oil. Um, so, and that's what we see here. This is a beach in downtown Santa Barbara, and you see a bunch of a bunch of bales of hay, and these guys are throwing on the hay. Here's some guys that are literally um, um, mopping up oil and throwing it into these barrels on these little floating barges, and, and they're, they're cleaning and like day in, day out, keep doing it. And, and people are thinking, really? This is this is it? This is the high tech, uh, you know, people that are going to land people on the moon. This is how we're dealing with this uh, this issue. So the second theme is this notion of techno technologically impotent in terms of our response. Our technology does not match the threat. We're behind. Um, and I would argue, uh, this is a aside, that this is a huge issue. This is, this is, a, le this is a lack of leadership. Um, there is money to invest in response technologies, but it has not been spent. Um, and that, that's a longer conversation. But so, so technologically impotent. Uh, next is, of course, the ecological impact. So, um, again, this is foreshadowing all of our interactions with oil spills since. So, oil spills happening, the then head of the oil company, after a couple days, goes down to Santa Barbara Harbor, all the, all the um, reporters are there, and he stands around and he says a couple things, but the most infamous quote that he said, and again, you, this happened with Deepwater Horizon, you see the same thing, there's, there's some really, really lame statements that are made by some of the folks uh, in, in, uh, that are in charge of the company or whatever. And, and so Fred Hartley starts this off. So he says, so he's, he's like, why are these people all bent out of shape? I don't get it, right? And he says, I don't like to call it, meaning the oil spill, I don't like to call it a disaster because there's been no loss of human life. Uh, I'm amazed at the publicity for the loss of a few birds. Ooh, ooh, right? Like, really? We're gonna have this conversation, really? And so, uh, clearly, after this was made, the the board of directors and everyone's like, ooh, no, he didn't really mean that. He meant, no, we really care about the birds, but it was the damage was already done, right? It was like, screw you. Who cares about some stupid birds, right? Nobody's hurt. Come on, suck it up, be a man, you know that kind of stuff. And so. Um, so the main legacy, in terms of the most obvious legacy uh, that we get to, uh, those other things are more subtle. That notion of feeling impotent, that notion of, of uncontrollability, that kind of stuff, that's sort of kind of in people, the back of people's minds. And the, the first thing in the front of their minds is this. So if you went to Santa Barbara, I went to Santa Barbara, as I already told you, but so this is the trifecta. So everybody surfed, all my roommates surfed, or almost all of them surfed, right? And so here's an oiled surfboard, can't surf on an oiled surfboard, 
Here's a poor little bird. Oh my God, poor little bird, it's covered with oil. And then there's a bunch of oiled kelp here next to the surfboard. And so that's representing more of the ecosystem and, everything, and it looked like everything was ending, right? What are we gonna do, what are we gonna do, what are we gonna do? A local vet uh, and, and, some, and some local wildlife enthusiasts started seeing all these dead birds. And so they said, well, let's start grabbing some of them and see if we can do something. So they literally started taking dishwashing detergent and, and washing the oil off their feathers. Now, um, these are seabirds, and just for background, seabirds need to stay warm just like you and I do. Even though they might be floating on top of the ocean or whatever, they need, still need to stay warm. Uh, there's different strategies, but mostly how they stay warm is they have very, very well-groomed feathers. And their feathers have these, these fine oils, and these feathers sort of form a, a, a kind of armor on them between the cold water and their, and their skin. So, any, so anytime you see a sea otter, anytime you see uh, any kind of furred or feathered critters that live in the ocean, they're always, uh, 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 they're always licking themselves or cleaning themselves because they want, or so-called they're preening, because they want to keep their feathers and stuff really, really clean. So normally that works well when you get a piece of dirt or, or whatever the heck on you, a piece of gunk of fish you're eating or something like that. But in this case, this is all toxic, this is poison, right? And so as they attempt to clean it, so it's not, so there's two things. One, the oil itself makes their feathers not work, right? So their feathers don't act as an insulating thing anymore. And their skin is now touching the cold water. So that's the first thing. Next, as they try to clean that, right, lick that stuff to get it clean, which they can't, it's, it's way beyond what they could possibly ever clean. Now they're ingesting, they're eating this poison and they are essentially poisoning themselves. So what these guys do is they pick up these birds and they start take, trying to take care of the external part of it. So they start taking dish detergent and essentially washing the oil out of their feathers. Great idea. It almost doesn't do anything because by the time most of these birds are captured, they've already tried to preen themselves. So they've already ingested a bunch of poison and within a few hours or days, most of these critters would die. Um, so we've gotten better at this. This is still a huge issue with, with oil spill stuff. By the time we get to the critters, a lot of times they've ingested the toxins. But we've gotten better. Um, but the main focus here now, nowadays is to get the birds really, really early. Get them super quick before they start to either ingest oil or before they ingest very much oil is, is the basic approach now. But this whole notion of emergency wildlife response is born with the 1969 oil spill that's now a global phenomenon. And then we start worrying about what does this do to the environment, which is what I spend most of my time on. So what is this doing to the barnacles? What is this doing to the fish? What is, doing this, what is this doing to all these different um, aspects of the environment? And again, because we didn't have good baseline information, after several years and all the big studies, people say, like me, say, well, we think this probably is what happened. But the statistical power to rigorously say, yes, this changed because of the oil spill, we just didn't have that for, for most things. Another key theme is this notion of a media and public outcry firestorm. And this now happens every, again every single spill. Um, and we could slice this up, and this is maybe one of the things you guys be working on, so you know, you'll, you'll explore this more, but um, suffice it to say, this was crazy, right? This was really, really crazy. So one of the, first, one of the things that, that comes out of, well, actually, let's stop there. So um, right here, this lower left, this is San Marcos High School, high school in Santa Barbara. Anybody go to San Marcos High, by the way? Any of you guys? Okay. Anyway, so this is a local high school. Obviously, the oil spill happens. It's just when people are coming back from uh, after Christmas break, winter break, and things are crazy, and you know the air smells bad, and it, you know it's all kinds of. It's like oh, having a wildfire disaster. So after a short time, things settle down. People start trying to get back to the routine. So this was the theater department. They were doing a, a play. I don't remember. I should have looked at camera what the play was, but it was, it was some regular play. And this was such a massive phenomenon, all the high school students said, no, screw that, throw the play out. Uh, we're gonna write our own play, and this play is gonna be about the oil spill. So they write a melodrama. Do you guys know what melodramas are? You know, the old black and white movies where the, it's always a woman, she's always blonde, and she's always like small, and she's like, oh, I need a man to save me. And she's tied up on a railroad track, right? She's like, oh, help! And there's some like dude in the top hat with a long, uh, what we now call a hipster, but back then it was like an evil dude, right? And you're like, oh my God, he's an evil dude with a weird handlebar mustache. And he's like, ha, 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 and like doing that with his fingers. And there's some like 
other always a white dude like kind of rides on, rides on it, I want to save you, like that kind of thing, that's a melodrama. So, so they were very popular in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and it was essentially, everything was on steroids. The bad was on steroids, the good was on steroids, right? it, was, it, was, it was this uh, sort of height to the nth degree. So they decided they're gonna write a, a melodrama about, you know, and so it's, it's an allegory for the oil spill, and the bad guy is an oil spill executive dripping oil, and the poor little lady is, her name's Barbara, I wonder what that's supposed to be, right? So Barbara, and, and it's all about uh, the oil spill, essentially, and the, and the evils of oil spill. So when an event drips down to high schoolers, you know that it's, it's permeated the culture, right? Um, then we have all kinds of other things happening. So, so here is uh, folks at uh, protesters protesting. A huge part of the, the, the knock-on effect of the Santa Barbara oil spill is to start all of these in, environmental groups and all this in, really, it didn't necessarily start the environmental movement, but it threw a massive amount of fuel onto it and got it going. So, so the modern protests and people started saying things like, hey, let's get rid of oil. Now, some of those folks drove to the protests in their like, 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 you know, like V8, you know, gazillion million ton car by themselves and got out and said, stop drilling for oil. So initially some of this was about, uh, you know, don't drill oil here. Right? I still want oil in my car, but let's get it from somewhere else. Eventually, it starts to become more sophisticated, and they say, look, we got to get rid of oil all over the place. But, but initially, it's, it's a bit of an uh, initial response, as, you would, as it would happen to anybody, right? When you're, you're assaulted, like, hey, let's stop that assault. Let's stop drilling here. And so it creates groups like this right here. You see this, this, this sign says, get oil out. That's one, that's one of the first groups that forms and is still in existence, uh, an, an environmental NGO environmental group, advocacy group. Uh, all kinds of other things happen. So these are a bunch of young ladies that are at the Santa Barbara airport, and when uh, dignitaries and reporters are coming in, they would do things like get naked. So they'd take off all their clothes. I'm like, we gotta pay attention to me. And people are like, what's that, right? And so, so all these different ways, getting naked, doing a new, doing a new play, doing art, all these kind of cultural expressions, because people were totally PO'd. People were like, this is messed up. This should not be happening. How did we get to this point? Um, sound familiar, maybe? Um, so, uh, and then another thing that'll happen, it just happened with Obama, with Deepwater Horizon, it happened with everybody. So this goes on for a while, and there's this sense of the government not responding properly or, or, or competently. So eventually, it could be a few days, could be a few weeks, eventually the leadership, that could be the governor, that could be, so in our case of our 2015 uh, Refugio oil spill, it was the governor. It was also uh, then Kamala Harris, who was our state attorney general. She ran down and she had to do a press conference even though she knew nothing about oil spills and she said some silly things in the press conference and it was super windy and so her hair is rolling in front of her face but she felt politically she needed to go up and show up there and say like, we're gonna get these bad guys, right? It always happens. It starts with here in this upper picture, this is President Nixon walking on the beach. What's he gonna do? He's not gonna do anything. He doesn't know anything. But he's gonna walk on the beach, and, and you know Obama does the same thing: walk on the beach, kick the sand, and well, yeah, this is bad, right? And so there's this notion that you have to be present. You, as our leader, have to come down, and we have to see you under, you know, walking the beach, uh, knowing that this is an issue. Um, and so then, then it really starts to bleed this political stuff. So here is the L.A. Times. Um, and here is, uh, uh, right after the, the, the um, oil spill started, there's all this stuff, right? Big white desert, snow, big huge snowstorm back east, that's, that's the top story and all this stuff. There is a story eventually about Santa Barbara, but it's, it's, it's not the headline, right? Very quickly, this will become the headline and become the headline for a long time. But initially, people don't recognize necessarily the oil, an, an oil spill especially a large oil spill, as something that's gonna be transformative or, or big. But, um, uh, but eventually, it goes on to things like Nixon saying after he walks on the beach, oh yeah, we shouldn't drill any more oil, right? So all of a sudden we start having these policy uh, 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 responses to the spill. I would just suggest that a lot of those policy issues are driven by the, by the, the firestorm. That the public is like, do something, do something, do something. 
They're not necessarily all well-reasoned. Let's think about this for a while and make sure it's a real great policy. It's more, oftentimes it's more of an re immediate response. So in this case, hey, let's talk about banning oil. Deepwater Horizon, President um, Obama is like, let's, let's stop all, or let's temp put a moratorium on offshore drilling, all these things. And, and they, those in turn tend to create backlash themselves. So here are the facts. This is what happened. You guys, it's almost, it's almost time to go. But these are the facts of the, San, of the Santa Barbara oil spill. So the primary, the primary release goes from Jan, in 1969 goes from January 28th to February 8th. Uh, it really was leaking oil for a year, but the main sort of huge amounts of oil, right, burbling up is about two weeks. Um, uh, what happened? Okay, it was a blow up. So we drill a shaft into the ground through rock, through substrate, and then we put a sheathing, a metal straw around that hole to make sure the hole doesn't collapse and everything. The oil, the, the drillers said, to the then USGS, United States Geo now, now, now we have different agencies that just handle this. But at the time they said, hey, USGS, which is sort of our government scientist guys that deal with geology and stuff, said, hey, uh, you know, we're drilling this, this deep pipe in the ground. Can we put the pipe all the way, should we, do we have to put the pipe all the way down at the very, very bottom? And the USGS said, eh, if you, that'd be great, but you don't have to. So the oil company said, okay, great. So they only put the armored pipe, the metal shaft, partway down in the two, into the hole. Um, and so what seems to have happened is um, as we were drilling that hole, we cracked, we, we, we fissured, we broke some of the rocks, right? So it wasn't a perfect uh, hole through a, a bunch of rock. It was a hole that had a bunch of cracks. And because we didn't armor it, when the oil started coming up from down deep, it, started, it got into those little cracks and eventually started getting out, getting in it, and it started leaking, right? So... Um, so yeah, so of the, the total length, only 7% of that, of that hole into the bottom of the ocean was metal or armored or sheathed. Um, and so, uh, so as this was happening, uh, as oil started coming up, what did they start to do? Plug the hole. So they initially, the guys on the wellhead started taking junk, literally, and jamming it into the hole. Jam, 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 jam. Cement bags, sand, and plug up the hole. And that at first kind of seemed like it was working, like, okay, good. But then all this pressure was built up, and because we had this armored straw that only went part, if the armored straw went all the way down to the reservoir, it probably would have worked. But because it was only part way, now we plug up the straw, eventually that pressure builds up and it makes the cracks even bigger. And so it just seeps out, and now there's no way to, to stop it, right? So it just leaked and leaked and leaked. Um, um, right. Okay, so as we, as we talked about, all these things came out. It's this huge, uh, the last little bit to say before we disappear, to remind you guys, Santa Barbara is a bunch of rich folks, yeah? Santa Barbara is close to Los Angeles. Los Angeles is the media epicenter of the world, right? Hollywood, uh, TV shows. So everybody that understands visual communication is there. These folks live in Santa Barbara, or they go vacation in Santa Barbara, or they go up for the weekend to have some wine and cheese in Santa Barbara. So these folks took this very personally, right? This was their home, this was their recreational spot, and they knew visuals, and oil was a, this is a visual thing, so it really, it was all this sort of this perfect storm. Boom, 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 boom. So it really creates this um, uh, uh, media circus, we crystallize the environmental movement, it sets in this narrative we seem to be trapped in, which is evil, greedy oil company that hates birds, right? Versus, uh, versus the birds, or evil, greedy oil company versus the not in my backyard enviros that just, just want the oil somewhere else, right? You don't care about jobs. You know, all the, so the, those silly narratives we're, we're trapped in, as opposed to having really honest conversations, get deep into it, let's have dialogue, we're trapped there. Uh, high toxicity to birds, marine mammals, and, and little things that live in the intertidal, so meaning those things got poisoned quite a lot. And the last little bit, this may be a little bit much for you guys, but, but this final study I mentioned, the sort of what have we learned study, that I said one of the main conclusions, we think this is going on, but we don't have any good statistics. We need to do more monitoring. That was the main conclusion. Uh, they suggested a couple, and so everybody's saying the world's gonna end, the world's gonna end, the world's gonna end, all our fisheries are gonna die. After a bit, you know, definitely impacted things, killed, killed dolphins and things, but after a while, they're like, oh, there's still dolphins here. Uh, we're still fishing here. 
Why is that? I thought you said the world was going to end. And so, so this has to do with why we, uh, why we think the world didn't end. There were different suggestions there. One, you care. So the microbes, these guys have lived in an area with oil all around. So therefore, they, maybe they developed some biochemical tolerance. They can eat oil, let's say. That definitely um, is part of what happened. They were primed for the oil, so it wasn't as bad as if they had never lived with oil ever. Um, another thing is we had some storms that came in and actually broke up the oil. Interestingly, people said that's a good thing because the oil was on the surface. All those storms do is make the oil clump together and sink. <laughs> so the fact that it's not on the surface, people are like, yeah, good. You know, screw the midwater, screw the bottom of the ocean, but still. Um, so, so the storms came in and then, uh, and then stuff sunk in general. Um, there are problems with these interpretations, but I'll just say that that was the official, uh, the official outcome. Um, and I think I'll probably stop there. Uh, I think I'll stop there. Is that cool? Does that make sense? Is that, is that enough? Do you guys want? Um, well, we, the class is over, but you can come No, no, I know. But, but I mean, was there, were there other key questions you guys wanted me to look at or, or give you a sense of? I just wanted you to tell the story. That's the story. <laughs> so the, the last bit of this is the stuff, what comes after this which is a couple key things, so jot these down before we go. One, uh, uh, California Coastal Act, 1972, actually starts as a ballot measure. That creates the California Coastal Commission. So the California Coastal Commission, a key output. This is an entity that the United Nations has called the most powerful land management agency in the world. Very, very strong. This, this is an entity that keeps our coast clean and manages beaches so you guys can get access to beaches, that's one. Two, a whole suite of environmental laws come in. The Endangered Species Act, 1973, a Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, um, all the, this, this whole host of state and federal environmental, the, the modern environmental era of environmental regulation starts uh, with, in response to the 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill. So we have entities at the state level, entities at the federal level, and then the environmental movement really gains a lot of steam. So the first Earth Day, starts in the wake of, in 1970, in the wake of the 69 oil spill. And, and so, so the ramifications we're still figuring out, but environmental movement, environmental regulation, uh, political activism in terms of environmental quality, those are three very, very clear results of this. Um, also, very practically, it becomes harder to drill in Santa Barbara, and so on the Santa Barbara Channel, because of this spill. There are other things, but those are the key ones. Cool? All right, any other questions you guys have? Awesome, great, thanks. Yeah.